Next slide, please. Oh, and we are being recorded and you probably just got the same notice I did that we are being recorded, just to make sure you know that. Uh, and thanks for joining us. So I will be uh, reviewing our agenda and talking about our, um, the purpose of this meeting and uh, just giving you a chance to, um, to, to land here with us. So uh, first of all, let me just go over the agenda. At, right now we're doing introductions and overview and then, and that includes an introduction to the team. And then we'll move on to the presentation by the team followed by question and answer at, tw mm -hmm. at 1040. And then um, at 11 a.m. we'll wrap up. Um, we do want you to know that, um, again, uh, just a reminder that this is being recorded. And uh, I do wanna take a few minutes to talk about some ground rules. I also wanna ask that you copy the Zoom link, alternate Zoom link that's in the chat just in case, unlikely situation, but just in case we are Zoom bombed, we wanna have an alternative uh, link. So that is there for your convenience. Please copy it in case we need it. So the purpose of this gathering is to provide an update to this group, uh, to those of you who are attending today, regarding the Population Health Initiative. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in terms of what that means. So uh, I'm just focusing a minute here. Um, so what, what we're, we are not asking for scientific feedback. We do want feedback on um, the particulars that occur to you in response to this presentation. So please participate with respect and listen with good intention. Use the chat box to ask questions and make comments and please stay muted. So again, our focus is on population health impacts. I will talk about that in just a minute um, in terms of what that means. And we do prefer putting your question in the chat box because we can prioritize the discussion and then also follow up later if we run out of time. We then also, that provides us with a record of the questions. You could raise your hand to ask a question without putting it in the chat and we will get to what we can get to. Uh, and Chris Hurley will be your go-to person for follow-up um, if we do run out of time and, and uh, follow-up and um, be available if we run out of time. So pay attention to her email address when that shows up on the last slide. So uh, this is a significant award, this population health award. So what is population health? So there are lots of factors like education and racism and poverty, the environment that impact health this approach, this population health approach to addressing health issues is much more holistic and interdisciplinary and inclusive than um, looking at health has been in the past, public health. So, uh, this, so the, this <coughs> holistic interdisciplinary inclusive approach um, is also centered on three pillars according to the University of Washington's population health initiative. They are the funder of this project. Those three pillars are human health, economic equity and environmental resilience and social and economic equity and third, the env environmental resilience. So this project is an incredible and exceptional opportunity to move what we know forward. This is, we've been waiting for this folks on a lot of levels, um, both in terms of understanding and analyzing now all the monitoring data that we've all been collecting for years and years and years and to begin to better understand the implications of this noise exposure for people in the environment. So uh, with no further delay, I would like to pass this over to Julian for the team member introductions. Thank you, Julian. Yeah, thanks so much and welcome everyone and good morning. Um, to start off, I thought it'd be really nice to kind of introduce the kind of the interdisciplinary team that's kind of embarking on this journey. Um, and I'll start off with the lead PI, um, Edmund. Edmund, you wanna introduce yourself to the group? Sure, good morning all. And that was a terrific introduction, Anne. Thanks for kicking us off. Uh, my name is Edmund Sito, and uh, as it says in the slide, I'm uh, from the School of Public Health, uh, and specifically, I'm in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences. Uh, we cover a lot of uh, air, po air pollution-related uh, issues, um, but noise, community noise, also falls within the realm of our department. 
Uh, so we're very much interested in working um, as part of the team and to getting as much feedback as we can from uh, the residents. And I'll Great. hand it over. Um, uh, it looks like Lauren is next to me on the screen. Yep. Great. My name is Lauren Keeney. I'm an environmental scientist. Um, I have a for the last several years, I've done work to uh, more monitoring work on growler noise in the Olympic Peninsula and would be, and I'm just delighted to be with such an amazing team of folks that bring a, a diverse expertise around this issue on this project. I'm, I'm an independent contractor is my official sort of role as well. Thanks, Lauren. And you want to introduce yourself again? Sure. So my academic background, my name is Ann Harvey. Um, my academic background is in social work, and I've worked in nonprofit management and taught at Antioch University for over 30 years. I'm now retired faculty emeritus and working actively in my community, both with the Sound Defense Alliance and the Coopville Farm to School Program. I do live in Coopville under my spouse of 38 years, right under one of the two growler flight paths, and she and I both really share the deep concern for our region and the impact of jet noise on everyone, on the communities as well as the environment, especially children. Thanks, Anne. Chris? We'll get Chris to unmute just momentarily. I should know this, really, sorry. Um, my name is Chris Hurley. I'm a Sound Defense Alliance volunteer. I'm a longtime community health uh, leader in S Seattle and I live on Whidbey now. Um, I taught at the University of Washington in my later years in community health and I'm um, pretty much a um, organizer on the, on the study, not a scientist. I enable other people to do good work. Great, thanks so much, Chris. Um, yeah, so my name is Julian Old and I'm a professor in the College of the Environment in Seattle. I've been here for a little over 15 years and the college and my research program is really interested in looking at the interface between human activities and kind of conservation issues broadly writ. Uh, most recently in my involvement in the Nature and Health Initiative on campus has been kind of bolstered where we're trying to look at the connections between nature and people and human well-being. So basically advancing the science to help inform both the practice and policy changes to kind of benefit uh, both people and nature. Um, with that, I'll pass it over to Gio. Thanks, Julian. Hey, everyone. Good morning. My name is Gio Jacuzzi, and uh, I'm an acoustician, also from the University of Washington uh, in the College of the Environment. And I have a background in professional microphone engineering and acoustic propagation modeling. So I'll be focusing mostly on the noise data analysis and kind of mapping phases of this project. And I'm um, really looking forward to, to being a part of the community and contributing in that way. So I'll pass it over to Bob next. Yes, good morning. My name is Bob Wilbur. I am a retired fishery biologist and science editor. I'm representing the core side of the team also known as citizens of EB's Reserve. So CORE has been at the legal front of the growler battle since about 2012 in kind of a uh, David versus Goliath standoff. But this past year, we actually had some significant success in court, which we won't get into now, but we may, if folks are interested, get into that during the Q&A. Okay, that's it. Back to Julian. Yep, thanks so much, Bob. Looks like we're right on schedule for the next um, 30 minutes or so. We're gonna be just giving a kind of a short kind of presentation and overview um, of, the, of the new project that we're on. And we're gonna end off with a ample time for a question and answer and have a, a community discussion, which <clears throat> we're all looking forward to. Um, so it's safe to say that this image right here is the reason why we're sharing an hour of our time together this morning. So coming in, at a total of about 60 feet uh, wingspan and over 33,000 pounds and a production cost of around 67 million each. Kind of this EA 18G growler was built to replace the prowler in the role of uh, tactical jamming of communications and launch systems. And is really considered the frontline force in the US military's kind of electromagnetic uh, warfare. Now the issue at hand is really not news to any of you on this call. And the, and, this, and the issue really has to do with the fact that military activity over Western Washington has really dramatically increased over the last decade, 
And in large part because of this national consolidation of, of growlers to the Naval Air Station Whidbey Island. And in recent years, there's been, you know, a dramatical increase in the number of growler operations, uh, roughly around 33% increase up to about 118 aircraft and many tens of thousands of, of training exercises or flight operations uh, per year. Now, these training exercises, as you're all well aware, occur in a, in a variety of areas, uh, including Alt Field near Oak Harbor and the outlying field, landing field near Coopville. And where these operations include, uh, you know, obviously aircraft circling around and performing brief touchdowns or touch and goes. And the issue is, as we all know, is growlers are the loudest plane in the world. Um, and much louder than the earlier ones that the Navy used, including the Prowler. So in, in contrast to the Prowler, the Growler is known for its intense, low-frequency engine rumble, hence the Growler name. And these expanded operations have really amplified kind of the noise, noise experienced by residents, uh, visitors, and wildlife in the, in the local region as well as beyond. Now, until recently, there's been kind of really insufficient research and limited data to quantify noise. We've made, you know, there's been a lot of strides done in that regard. But in particular, the link between this noise pollution and the ability to evaluate human and wildlife impacts has been lacking. I um, mean, that's what this project um, seeks to do is to uh, elucidate kind of those interactions in so much so that we can evaluate the effects in the first place and with the aim of informing mitigation uh, strategies moving forward. So noise to many of us, it can be defined as this, an unwanted or disturbing sound. It affects the health and well-being of humans and other organisms. It, and uh, later on, we'll be talking a little bit about, you know, just how it affects humans and the types of impacts that people are most worried about. And when it comes to growler operations, I we thought it would be just you know good to kind of just highlight just broadly kind of the challenges that that many of you are hearing on a daily basis. You know, in Whitby Island, for example, there's been you know intensive sound monitoring efforts uh, done by Core Sound Defense Alliance, Quiet Skies, and, and a variety of other local um, agencies to try to monitor and understand what the extent of this noise pollution. Um, as, an, uh, as a result of training by growler activities. So this, these efforts have extended over extended time periods. And the reality is, is that, you know, these activities um, can, can um, these flight activities or what we call these flight carrier landing practices, these SCLPs can result in, um, in periods of, of loud noise intensities. Where we're talking about in the hundred, you know, exceeding hundred decibels in some places and, and peaks at around 118 uh, decibels. So these activities are numerous, as all of you are well aware, and the acute noise experienced by these um, infrequent but uh, low frequency and high intensity um, uh, uh, activities, right, are particularly, um, you know, concerning. And that's why we're all here. And that was really the impetus behind the research project that we're, we're starting right now. I just want to highlight the fact that this noise pollution is not localized um, to Whidbey Island. You know, this extends beyond work by Lauren Keeney and myself on the call here really was focusing in on the fact that these noise, this noise pollution and this noise footprint of growler activities extel, extends all the way out to the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, U.S. Navy's own analysis in, in 2020 found over 4,000 growler flights take place over the Olympic Peninsula, averaging over a dozen per year, and that these flight activities are concentrated during weekdays and, and daylight hours. And of course, all of this is not experienced by both in Whidbey Island as well as in the Olympic Peninsula all at once, but it's interspersed at multiple multiple times during the year uh, during the day. So um, the the fact is is that the duration of the time that military aircraft was audible is was kind of found across multiple sites in space. So this is not just a localized issue, but also a broader issue across the region. And this kind of increased, uh, you know, obviously issues around and debate and conversations around uh, noise by Navy growler activity has permeated into the into the media, and obvious. Um, and you know, this is just you know a small number of headlines, which shows obviously the severity and the uh, of this issue, 
and just the the you know the controversy and just the importance of this issue um, uh, coming to light. Um, Bob later on during our Q and A period will provide a little bit of update. Um, but you know, suffice it to say that you know these headlines are also manifested, obviously, in the individual experiences of of people on the landscape. What I've shown here is just a collection of the thousands of noise uh, noise complaints that are received um, each year. Uh, this is collated by Quiet Skies by San Juan County to just to talk about the degree at which this is, uh, you know, um, experienced on the landscape. So you can just spend a second here to kind of look at, you know, various words or that are used to describe uh, the noise pollution experienced on the ground, just to kind of, again, highlight the fact that um, this is a very pervasive issue, but an issue in which Although in words we can describe it as affecting our health and well-being, from a scientific perspective, those linkages are not as solid or solidified as we would like. And again, that's what this project is aiming to do. So the you know the issue here before I pass it over to Edmund is the fact that noise from growlers is much more likely to be an annoying and upset because it falls into this category of, of, of noise that is both unexpected, it's intermittent, so it can't be anticipated. And obviously we lack control over when it happens and how much it happens. And this really, in many ways, kind of uh, leads us to the challenge ahead with respect to um, the potential human health impacts of growler activity. So I'll pass this over to Edmund to talk a little bit about this and to go over just a little overview of what noise stress means for humans and human well-being. Um, Edmund? Right. So, so this slide is an interesting slide in that um, it illustrates how many of those previous complaints aren't being ignored. Uh, you know, there are some agencies that are uh taking the complaints seriously and and one of those agencies is the washington state Bo uh, board of health and you know the first bullet point refers to uh, a literature review that was done in response to an environmental impact assessment on the navy's growler jet operations and uh you've probably seen in the newspapers some back and forth around you know, different health agencies wanting to deal with it, other health agencies maybe not wanting to deal with it. But in 2017, um, uh, the State Board of Health actually submitted a letter uh, with a literature review uh, in response to an environmental impact assessment stating that really there, there is sufficient evidence for noise-related health impacts, and in particular, aircraft-related noise health impacts. Um, and perhaps there's some uncertainty around military aircraft and their health effects, but that uncertainty really should not preclude uh, folks as part of the EIA process for looking at noise related health impacts. And so they called very strongly for a health impact assessment to be conducted. Uh, they noted that this isn't a hypothetical exercise, that there are actually people living uh, in this region. Uh, and so the complaints are real and the noise impacts are likely real. Um, there certainly are sufficient studies, uh, which um, we'll show later, uh, that could be used to quantify health-related impacts. Um, so why aren't we doing that? So that was the gist, I think, of that letter. And, and moreover, there's certainly, as, as Julian uh, showed earlier, um, there's a long history of noise measurements uh, that have been done. Uh, so there, there is ample data on noise uh, that we should be looking at to, to quantify these health impacts. Um, and so you'll see uh, a federal judge ruled that the Navy actually did not adequately assess and consider potential health imp and well-being impacts um, of aircraft in their environmental impact assessments. And so that 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 is motivating uh, more work in this area, including our work. Next slide, please. So Julian showed um, some qualitative uh, experiences, uh, um, how people um, have documented their noise complaints. And you may have noticed 
many of those complaints jive with what we know uh, from the scientific literature. Uh, there are complaints about uh, not being able to sleep or sleep disruption. And there certainly are plenty of studies that have looked at um, short-term high intensity noise levels as being the cause of sleep disruption. Uh, there are some other things which are more systemic uh, physical effects that happen. Um, in the previous noise complaints, you may have noticed uh, concerns about annoyance um, and, uh, and not knowing what to do about it, lack of control. Um, those are all indicative of some of the physical responses that have to do with our hormonal system and our autonomic uh, nervous system. And so you'll see some things here that reflect that. Elevated adrenaline levels, uh, elevation of cortisol production. These are all stress, uh, uh, what do they call them? Flight or fight responses that our body has um, when we're um, stimulated by things like noise. Uh, there are follow-on physical effects from those increased cortisol and uh, other hormonal levels. Uh, it affects our uh, peripheral cardiovascular system. And so that's why you'll see things like um, hypertension, elevated blood pressure. The noise makes our blood boil, <laughs> if you will. Um, and what does that do? That also has some long-term effects on cardiovascular health. So you'll think, see things like studies looking at vasoconstriction and its downstream impacts on myocardial infarction uh, and so forth and so on. So these are, these are serious health outcomes that we normally attribute uh, to uh, lifetime exposures. Um, uh, 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 and so perhaps in, in, in middle age to older populations that are exposed over time to, to these stimuli. Um, at the same time, uh, there are effects on younger aged individuals. And there uh, now is quite a rich um, scientific evidence base looking at noise impacts on children. You see a little bit of it here, um, delayed cognitive development in children. Uh, but there also are documented studies looking at children's performance on standardized tests. Let me say I hate standardized tests. I don't believe in them. But there are studies that have documented noise effects on um, children's standardized uh, uh, test performance. Um, perhaps more interesting are studies that have looked at specific aspects of children's learning, like reading comprehension, like memory, uh, which all have the potential to be impacted by noise. Um, Understanding a, uh, their teacher in a noisy classroom, that might be another one that uh, 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 is, is, would ring true uh, to you that have children. Um, so many of these things actually um, that we think of perhaps as affecting older age populations are now also being studied in children. So for instance, the, the, the blood pressure and the cardiovascular effects, we wouldn't normally think about those affecting children um, and that being a serious problem. But there are studies that are starting to document that noise actually affects these uh, hormonal and cardiovascular impacts in young, younger age children. Next slide, please. So I mentioned uh, earlier that um, there is uh, quite a bit of data uh, on noise. And uh, what's interesting about uh, the noise data is that uh, upstream of that, um, it's impacted by flights. And uh, this is a study which uh, was done uh, in collaboration with Beacon Hill residents, where uh, we looked at flight paths to design a study that would um, correlate those flight paths with uh, noise levels that we were collecting in the community. Uh, this is a relative, uh, the geographic bounds of it was, were relatively small, um, but you can kind of notice that um, a lot of our measurements were conducted right underneath the flight path. Um, and this was interesting because uh, the folks in Beacon Hill, uh, the, for a little bit of context, um, they fall outside of what SeaTac International Airport considers the airport, airport impacted zone of a 65 uh, dB uh, contour. Uh, and so they, the residents of Beacon Hill don't qualify for noise mitigation efforts uh, from the Port of Seattle. 
Um, and the measurements that we had collected, uh, even though they're not FAA measurements, um, clearly show that you know cumulative uh, noise exposures, cumulative meaning um, from the aircraft, from the city, from the roadway traffic, uh, uh, cumulatively, all those noise sources do uh, certainly fall above the 65 dB contours. And so uh, whether or not it's attributable to the attributable to the aircraft, there certainly are noise issues within um, uh, many of our communities in the region. Next. So uh, thinking about the, the project objectives that we have for our population health initiative uh, study, um, the first one is to improve our understanding of noise pollution uh, and its pervasiveness um, uh, from growler jet activities uh, and uh, in terms of taking the existing noise uh, data that's out there, there's lots of it, um, and quantifying community noise exposures. Uh, and also uh, thinking about it from this health impact assessment lens where we would be able to quantify uh, their associated health risks. Um, the second uh, aim of our study is to evaluate the implications of noise exposures for people um, and the environment. And uh, really, we want to engage in conversations around how communities can understand their impact and perhaps providing some uh, next steps to inform policy and mitigation options. Next. Great. Thanks, Edmund. Uh, we'll pass it over to Gio, who will talk a little bit about the project overview. Yeah, thanks, Julian. So I guess the question now is how exactly are we going to quantify these exposures and what are the steps that we need to take to understand their potential impacts on communities? So we can break the project down into four primary phases. First, we start with an extensive database of noise data. Um, next, we analyze these data to produce key metrics that can describe the noise in terms of its character and its exposure. And then following that, we can use models that Edmund will talk a little bit more about for different aspects of human health to estimate the potential impacts of that noise on people. And finally, we can map these results across the region to get a spatial understanding of where these impacts are most notable. Um, next slide, please. So we've aggregated a large archive of noise data spanning about 11 years of monitoring efforts from several organizations with a substantial amount of that data um, coming from SDA and CORE. And in total, we have more than 50 individual sampling sites and tens of thousands of hours of recorded data um, to pull from. And if you look at the map here of Whidbey Island, you can see that each of these dots represents uh, a location where data was collected, including audio from microphones and sound pressure levels in cases from SPL meters. So we'll take the data we've collected at each of these individual locations, and we can analyze them in detail. Next. So starting with looking at single noise events, like a single flyby, a takeoff, or a landing, we can measure things like the maximum level and the total sound energy of that event. But these individual noise events, which may and often do occur many times, are typically averaged over each hour to estimate cumulative exposure. And then by combining these hourly estimates, we can characterize an entire 24 hour period with what's called the day night average sound level or DNL. Um, and DNL is interesting because it's, it's the go-to standard metric that's used in most legal policy and health assessment to kind of measure long-term noise exposure. Um, however, it was designed to characterize longer, continuous kinds of noise like road traffic and commercial flights. Uh, next slide, please. Now, why is that significant? Um, because DNL averages the noise over time without taking into consideration the number of individual events, you can think of a day on Whidbey with only one particularly loud flyby having the same impact as a day with 100 slightly less loud flybys. Um, and although that number is the same on paper, the DNL value, we're confident that the effect on the community is much different. Um, so the takeaway here is that because growler activity tends to be sporadic and transient in these training operations, the DNL standard alone isn't sufficient to describe it. 
So because of this, we're going to take a look into a suite of supplemental metrics that will take that into consideration. Um, now I'm going to pass the ball back to Edmund briefly to talk about how exactly we can connect these metrics to impacts in human health. Yeah, so, so as I mentioned earlier, many of these uh, impacts we can think of in terms of, um, you know, how different types of metrics would relate to them. Uh, so for instance, the first one, which we see here, sleep disturbance, um, does it really make sense to have that DNL measure that's kind of an average over uh, time? Perhaps it doesn't matter. Um, uh, that's not our... Perhaps it matters, but that's not the, the correct metric, uh, the best metric for sleep disturbance. Maybe it's more um, uh, the short-term measures that capture individual flights. And maybe it's those flights that occur, um, you know, in the, in the, the times that are, pe people are sleeping that matter most for, for sleep disturbance. Annoyance, on the other hand, uh, perhaps maybe the, the longer-term average might be more relevant um, uh, to... Uh, to, to quantifying uh, annoyance. And so as we think about, you know, what these different health impacts are, they probably align with different types of metrics. Um, and people um, in different studies would probably look at different metrics uh, to, to, to quantify health effects. Next. So for example of how these different metrics come into play and how they can be used uh, to look at health effects, um, here are a number of different examples that come out of the literature. Um, they're called uh, exposure response relationships or noise curves. Um, and they all, you know, take on sort of similar uh, X and Y axes, if you will. So on the X axis, you'll, you'll notice that uh, it's a, uh, the big one is an LDN. It's a noise, it's one of those noise metrics. Uh, so the LDN is uh, the one that's time averaged over a 24-hour period. Um, and on the y-axis, you can see it's the percentage of individuals that are uh, impacted by a particular health outcome. So it's noise exposure versus um, likelihood of a health outcome. Uh, and so you could see, uh, if we look at the, health, uh, the, the percentage of highly annoyed um, uh, curve, uh, there are different curves that represent different noise sources. Military aircraft is shown on this. Um, and you could see if you look up, say, from you know, 60 dB, you could see um, how the impact of military air aircraft, even when you average it over a 24-hour period, is much, much higher than the other noise sources. And as you get to no higher and higher noise levels, um, the, the military aircraft, uh, the percentage of individuals within a community that would say that they're highly annoyed just ends up being higher and higher, uh, more so than the other types of noise uh, that exist in a community setting. So that's, that's how these curves work. And if you think about um, all that noise data that we have uh, uh, that's measuring growler jet, uh, uh, we, we could we could basically draw lines up from the different noise levels that exist in different areas to say what is the likelihood or what percentage of the population, the community that lives in those areas around those noise monitoring spots might say that they're highly annoyed. Okay, And you'll notice um, all around the periphery are other uh, noise curves or exposure response relationships, things that are looking at uh, sleep disturbance. So there's the aircraft aircraft awakening um, curve. Again, it's got you know a noise metric on the x-axis. In this case, it's the noise level at night uh, versus uh, the percentage of individuals that would report that their sleep was disturbed. Uh, and uh, and there's one uh, on the bottom right which looks at cardiovascular disease. Uh, which is a little different um, metric on the y-axis. It's a hazard ratio. And so it's the, it's the ratio of individuals um, versus some baseline risk uh, uh, that, that would describe their, their elevated chances of having um, cardiovascular disease. But again, it's, it's a noise metric on the, on the x-axis. Next. Um, Hearing um, 
also also comes into play uh, often in conversations. Um, a lot of what we know about hearing loss uh, comes from occupational studies. And, you know, it's interesting within the, the community noise uh, literature, oftentimes we don't really think of hearing loss as an issue. Um, the noise levels uh, in most community settings isn't high enough um, as it is, say, in a, in a factory or an occupational setting where someone could be using a jackhammer or something like that. Where hearing uh, definitely hearing conservation would definitely be important, um, but as many of you know, when we're talking about military aircraft, those those noise levels, those short term noise levels, are getting into those um, levels where uh, you, you know they're crossing over into what we would normally think of as yeah, they're similar to occupational noise. Um, levels. And so you could see some of the descriptors here in terms of, you know, sustained exposure can cause hearing damage. Um, these might be, uh, uh, you know, at around 80, 85, you're starting to get some threshold shifts or uh, tinnitus. Um, and then as you sort of get into higher levels above 100 dB, um, you start to get into to actual physical pain. Um, and, you know, the way that OSHA or the occupational safety folks think about uh, exposures, they usually think about noise exposures from an eight hour work shift perspective. Um, uh, and the idea is that they establish their noise standards based on the, this understanding that, well, we allow uh, people to be exposed to certain levels underneath an occupational standard with the understanding that they normally can go home and they could recuperate because their home environments aren't as noisy as their work environments. Um, if community noise levels are actually approaching 80, 90s, and 100s, and people don't have respite from those noise levels because it's not an eight-hour work shift that that exposure occurs over, um, then that certainly uh, could, could uh, uh, be a problem. Next. Great, we'll kick it back over to Gio now. <clears throat> Thanks, Julian. So once we've analyzed these noise levels and quantified their health impacts, as Edmund explained, um, what we can then do is map the results across the region of Island County and beyond to get a spatial understanding of where these impacts are. Um, from the noise data specifically, we can produce sound contours, which are kind of like heat maps for noise levels, which is what you see in the, the big picture here. And what we can do then is layer these distributions of noise with population maps to kind of reveal the density of exposure and the associated health risks on a spatial scale. Um, and we can also integrate other layers like zoning maps to understand the exposure of sensitive areas in particular, like residential neighborhoods or schools and hospitals and the like, um, and also any associated regulations like OSHA regulations um, for those regions. Uh, next, please. So this is just an example of a noise study that Edmund actually did um, in the past that illustrates how we can transform noise measurements into the likelihood that residents of different city blocks of San Francisco would be highly annoyed, for example. Um, so we'll do the same kind of mapping for Whidbey, but looking at this suite of health impacts to understand um, the efficacy across the region. Um, so now I'll just hand it back to Julian to talk about kind of what we aim to do with these results at the end of the day. Yeah, thanks, Gio. So kind of the accumulation of knowledge <clears throat> that um, that uh, Edmund and Gio just kind of talked about, the most important step of this project is actually uh, communicating and mating, making the science widely available to the community. And that's that we're particularly interested in developing these tools or these platforms to allow us to do that. Um, so among the multiple products that come out of this, one obviously fundamentally is science, science that basically can drive policy change and management decisions moving forward, and then translating that science into products such as the, like uh, uh, story maps, which allow us to explore what these potential health impacts are across space and in time, how it affects particular community um, uh, facets of the community. Um, and allowing for this multimedia content to kind of be used 
to be communicated to a, a variety of audiences, including yourself. These maps, uh, we'll seek for these maps to be interactive so that you can have a broader perspective on the overall level of potential health impacts, but also be a little bit more surgical in the sense of being able to zoom into your area where you live, where your family members live, areas in which you are interested in better understanding what these potential health implications um, are so that, the, um, so that you have the ability to evaluate um, and value your own risk to uh, what uh, this growling noise activity might mean for your for your health and well-being. So there's a number of net steps and future opportunities. You know, one thing that wasn't mentioned that this was a um, you know this was funded by the Public Health Initiative. Um, it's you know part seed funding to kind of spur on and provide opportunities to further explore the issues and challenges associated with noise and growler activities. Um, the hope and the, uh, is that the work that we do here helps inform not only the understanding of what these impacts might be, but more importantly, provides a scientific basis to help um, guide mitigation actions, both in impacted communities, as well as as we continue to seek out policy solutions moving forward. We also are hoping that this is really kind of the seed to a number of additional studies which will help us assess, among other things, you know, the lived experience of communities when exposed to these health, uh, when exposed to these noise pollution. Um, also, better understanding what you know beyond human populations, what the impacts are on wildlife, and and also more broadly on the impacts on ecosystems and the important services that we hope to render from them. So, with that, I think we're right on time. We're going to take a little moment here to, um, you know, Chris is going to collate some questions. We're going to give her a second just to kind of catch up on that. Um, I kind of encourage anyone to uh, insert their questions in the chat box, and we'll be able to hopefully get to those and start a communication. I'm going to invite the entire team now to kind of be involved with kind of this question and answer period. Um, and then maybe leading into this, Bob, if you're available right there. Now you can maybe just lead us off with just a couple minutes uh, providing the most latest um, update while Chris gets the questions together. Yes, sure. Um, so as I mentioned in, in the intro uh, this past year, we actually had some significant success in court. Quick background is that in 2021, CORE and the state attorney general filed lawsuits addressing deficiencies in the Navy's EIS that expanded the growler operations on Whitby Island. Uh, when the uh, legal maneuvering and dust finally settled out, the judge found the Navy, Navy's EIS to be deficient on four separate counts. Uh, I won't get into those uh, unless people wish to uh, question that, but the, uh, the, the short of it is that a revised EIS is now required. Uh, that will take surely some time to complete. And in the interim, CORE and the Attorney General have requested the court to vacate the EIS. Uh, vacature would roll back uh, growler flights to pre-EIS levels, something the Navy is expected to uh, resist strenuously and is certain to raise national defense issues. So our request is anything but a slam dunk. We'll just have to wait and see. So that's kind of where we are right now. <clears throat> Thanks, Bob. I'm gonna dive right into questions since we have 15 more minutes. And as I lead into that, I just wanna uh, remind folks who haven't had a chance to add your own name and location where you live. That's just wonderful information for us to have. For example, we have people here from Michigan, Colorado, Vermont, and Alabama. So I just wanna acknowledge this is a national issue in addition to being a regional issue. And we really appreciate the participation of folks from across the country as well as our elected officials. I know that uh, Melanie Bacon's here, our county commissioner, and Kate Dean, Jefferson County Commissioner. So thanks. Uh, and there may be others who are representing other elected officials' offices. So thank you to all of you for being here today. And let's just dive right into Jim Short's question. Thank you, Jim. And his question is, how are you assessing the variable of weather for noise impact? 
and connected to that, what are the, maybe not connected to that separate question, what are the variables in individual planes and pilots for noise impact? So a question about the variable of weather and the variables in individual planes and pilots for noise impact. Who would like to take that one? I can, I can talk, okay, about, I can the talk about the weather side of things. Side of oh, I you. think maybe, yeah, sorry. Wasn't muted for a moment. Um, so that's a really good point is obviously we have a lot of seasonal variability in the area and rain is louder in general. Um, so the nice thing is that with a lot of these individual event and averaging metrics, um, they take into account the ambient level. So basically for that period of time, that period of weather precipitation, say, um, we can have a good representation of what the baseline sound level is and then measure only the effects that are introduced by the noise alone on top of that baseline. So um, that can account for changes in weather um, affecting affecting registered values. And then the variables in individual planes and pilots for noise impact. I mean, I can take a hack at that. I mean, I think, um, I mean, challenging, getting down to individual plane effects it, it, it is challenging, right? We're basically looking at, you know, flight pathways or at least projected flight pathways and, and using sound as basically putting our finger on the pulse on kind of where that noise is kind of spatially distributed across the landscape. Um, so, you know, I, uh, at this level, we're interested in kind of the accumulative impacts of, of that flight activity as opposed to the kind of individual attributes of planes and their pilots in terms of the effects on noise. Thank you, Julian. So from Patty Houts Hussey, how are you monitoring these when the growlers don't follow their routes? So they go out of where you might be monitoring. And there's a second question, but let's just start with that one. Well, I mean, I, I can start us, I can start us off unless uh, Lauren was jumping in there. It's like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can do that. I've done some of the monitoring. Um, I mean, I think the emphasis, particularly at this stage, there, the, the information that we have to relate noise to health impacts is a little bit more rudimentary. We're not at that stage yet, right, of being able to specify, well, are they on their path or are they not on their path? This is more about cumulative noise exposures from an entire day, for example, or an entire hour of noise exposures. So certainly, you know, and SeaTac Airport is a good example because I think SeaTac is starting to deal with these are, you know, when flights are outside of their paths or how far outside of their predicted paths, these kind of things. But for this type of work, we're not able to do that. We're still at the level of cumulative hourly day long exposures, these kind of things, or, coll or collective more longer term exposures. Hopefully that answers the question. Thanks, Lauren. And the second part of that um, from Patty is, how do you monitor the emotional feeling of being in a, of war, being in a war zone when the growlers, growlers are continuing to go, to go and on and on at night? I think I'm going to be related to the planned lived experience work. Or is, is that kind of what our if one of y'all wanted to talk about that, or I can talk about it. Um, go I for it, Lauren, you started. <laughs> I'll go for it. So, yeah, and I'll follow up, Lauren. Okay, great, super, thanks, Evan. Um, so the, Julian referenced this, is that this particular funding opportunity was a is an interim, it's not a pilot project, it's not a full-blown project, it's more of an interim stage project, and it is intended to lay the foundation for um, follow-up work that hopefully would be done after this study um, that would start to get into that because that is the challenge, right? We have these broad population health um, relationships that we can um, start to make these connections, which, which would be a huge step in the research. Like right now, we don't even have that available, but it does, those do not get into the individual experience. And that is a, just a, a, a lack of historical research into how noise impacts people. And then specifically how this type of noise, which is different than road noise, it is different than commercial aircraft noise. So we're dealing with something that has just been understudied for many, many reasons. Um, but this project is intended to lay the foundation for that future work, where we would actually probably go out and survey and try and assess that lived experience. 
And I'll just add, you know, these comments, um, you know, the emotional feeling of being in a war zone, mm -hmm. you know, makes me try and think about how to align that with, uh, you know, those noise curves that we have literature for. Uh, and so when I hear that comment, I think about it's important for us to be looking at that noise annoyance curve, certainly. Um, but at the same time, if there's a, a, a curve for hypertension uh, and increased blood pressure, that comment makes me think like we should be looking at it. If there's one for other sort of psych psychosocial stress, um, uh, depression even, depression's a little bit different. Uh, uh, but all of those perhaps are relevant for us to dig into. Um, and so, you know, as we hear more about that lived experience, this is the kind of literature that we're going to try and pair it with. Thanks, Edmund. And I think uh, the next comment from Sharon Buck just underscores the same theme. She was saying that was my question as well, and she references PTSD. So Cindy Robinson asks, when do you anticipate the project findings will be available? Excellent question. Um, so, um, in um, in and uh, funding was awarded late this summer, and in earnest, uh, the project started this fall. So, um, so we're kind of at the initial stages. But having said that, um, uh, we are um, are launching off. Sorry for that pun. Is is uh, very quick in the sense that uh, there's been a large amount of uh, data that's been collected in the past and already correlated. correlated. So we have that advantage of having that data in hand and moving forward. So in general products, you could expect products from this research coming out in the springtime, I would say, um, into the early summer. Um, but one thing that we will be doing is communicating results and outcomes as they come, um, as opposed to waiting until the end to throw it out there. So I'm gonna go ahead in a second and in the chat, I'm gonna put a couple emails for people who wanna kind of ask questions around the research as well as around the community engagement. Um, but in earnest, you can imagine in kind of 2023, you'll start to um, hear more from us. Thanks, Julian. So from Alex Foster, thank you, Alex. Are you only mapping Whidbey Island? What about the Olympic Peninsula, the Skagit River, a pathway of the Growlers as well? Great question. Yeah. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, we definitely so we do have a large group of monitoring sites across years that have been distributed throughout the peninsula as well um, that we do plan on mapping. In addition to would be the nice thing is that um, a lot of these uh, effects, you know, they're not particular to any individual sites. A lot of the analyses that we'd like to do um, it depends a little bit on the kind of data that we've been able to acquire at different locations, and that is variable because it's coming from different points in time, different organizations with different approaches to noise monitoring. But our goal is to be able to map as much as we can um, from the data that we have. And um, I think that includes a substantial amount of monitoring that has been done on the peninsula. I think a caveat to that is quite a few of those sites are located within, for example, the Olympic National Park and are not necessarily as directly correlated to kind of the, the public health impacts that we're trying to get at with this study specifically, um, but they can still be analyzed in very much um, a similar way, so. Thanks, Gio. So uh, Jennifer Hagen says heat maps for noise, for noise are fine, but using them to describe risk to humans would be unsettling. For example, low human population areas like forks. Um, and so that, comment is um, no, well noted. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Nina's here from New York. All right, Nina, great. Uh, and then a question from my PC. I appreciate the noise experienced on Whidbey. The noise over San Juan County is different. Roar and vibration from takeoffs and noisy flyovers. Will you include this in your research, in your monitoring? Great question. Yeah, we do have a couple monitoring stations um, kind of south in San Juan County that I think will do a good job of um, getting an estimate of coverage over that general area. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm missing any additional points that maybe Lauren would know of, um, but we do have some, some measurement locations in that area, which is going to be very useful for that question. Thanks for bringing that up. Thanks, Gio. 
I, and I, I don't have anything, Gio, to add to that, but I did want to just briefly touch on Jennifer's question. Um, so yes, there's two avenues. One is that the follow-up to this study is hopefully going to be some assessment of this lived experience, which gets more at that when you average out a inter intermittent noise, it, it tends to uh, not have a good relationship with these population health impacts, which are usually louder sounds, uh, sorry, not louder sounds, um, more continuous noise. However, the other part of that is Geo talked about this, is that part of this project is trying to explore uh, a suite of metrics that is not necessarily just the average. And so that will start to get into things like, you know, uh, periodicity, frequency of events, uh, difference from background noise, those kind of things. So there is included some exploration of those types of metrics, at least in this project. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, Patty said in the 80s, the Navy wanted to locate their Chinook helicopter base at the Bayview Airport outside of Bayview Edison area. Animal husbandry was used in our fight against this. We got the local farmers on board. That type of noise affects milking and birthing of farm animals. I don't know who did these studies. Have you all addressed this as well? Does anybody know anything about those um, kinds of studies related to um, farm animals, animal husbandry? Yeah, um, that, that, that's a great point. Um, I, I have, I haven't. Um, so that's actually a really, a really good point and maybe a reminder to others, right. That, you know, as we think about additional phases of this research to get into, um, non-human impacts, um, that's a very important one. And I think really shows you how pervasive and across, uh, uh pervasive these impacts can be and, and in multiple sectors. So yeah, thank you for that reminder. That's great. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, Gary, for the reminder about the uh, background sound, the bell. Patty asked about Bob Ferguson's lawsuit, and I do believe that um, that the um, overview that Bob gave um, from CORE it, it addressed the combination of those two lawsuits of both the um, CORE and uh, Attorney General's lawsuits. Bill Scooby, from 1988 to 2001, the Navy published flight operation schedules for Coopville OLF and Alt Field by day and nighttime duration by hour. Most recently, schedules are only published by day in global terms. Having more precise schedules really helps anticipation and civilian day planning. How can your study back up civilian requests for better scheduling and management of noise impacts? Thank you, Bill. Yeah, thanks, Bill. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think in some ways, the results from the first aspect of the, our study is going to actually just show you how infrequent and spatially diverse those impacts are through our, through the sound monitoring and then analysis. So I think, you know, precursor to that is to show, in fact, that um, it is highly variable. And then by, and then by doing that, it shows that daily daily flight plans are not sufficient, uh, particularly when those impacts are gonna, again, like you said, are manifested at kind of sub daily time scales and are highly variable across space. So and I would say I can, in, the, in the most fundamental way, that would be one step forward. Yeah, Bob? And I, I can add a bit to that. Uh, and that is that we have in our negotiations with the Navy during uh, for uh, interim relief remedy, uh, we have mentioned that the flight schedules Oftentimes, they're not only erroneous but changed willy-nilly, and we uh, and the Navy has expressed some um, uh, willingness, I think, to try to improve the accuracy of the schedule and the timeliness of it too. If they're going to, uh, oftentimes there's a great difference between the different tracks that they may use, and so that they could let us know what tracks and the times that will help people out, uh, perhaps avoid the noise exposure. So. We're working on that, we'll see. Thank you, Bob. So just acknowledge that as we're wrapping up, I was, as we are wrapping up now, that uh, if you have questions about the research, Edmund and Julian and Geo's emails are in the chat, as well as Bob Wilbur's and my emails, if you would like to get more involved with CORE or the Sound Defense Alliance. Um, please continue reporting your noise incidents to the San Juan County noise mapping project. And that is, uh, I think it's both on CORE as well as SDA's websites. And it's uh, also located here in the chat. 
Uh, just to acknowledge James Marklees from Burlington, Vermont. Thank you for joining us, James. I'm gonna send your question to Bob about um, pursuing uh, enforcing DOD regulations. I think um, you, the two of you could talk about that after this because it's one minute after 11. So I am going to wrap us up and thank you Gio and Julian and Edmund for your wonderful presentation and to Chris and Lauren for all the work you've done to actually give birth to this project. Uh, and it's just a great honor, great privilege to be connected to such a wonderful team. So thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody.